The Reform Podcast. Podcast. It's for fun. Fun. Uh, Still time for one more bad decision. Let's get crazy. <laughs> While Les and Tanner love to talk about theology, they are not ordained, and they are not. And they are not your pastors. They are not your pastors. If you're a Christian, if you're a Christian listening to this show, your butt better be in a pew on Sunday. Enjoy the show. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the very first live episode of the Reform Podcast. I'm Les. And I'm Tanner. Ligonier National Conference. What's up, guys? Yeah. We are incredibly honored to be here. I'm kind of confused a little bit. Uh, I was, you know, listening to all the speakers over the past couple days. Like, Ligonier is such an important thing. And then they invited us to, to come and uh, be idiots on the stage. So uh, we're just so honored to do that. I guess, like, this is like the pinnacle, right? Like, there's nothing... There's nowhere to go from here. Yeah, we're done after this. We just drop our mics. This is actually our last episode. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's nowhere to go. Um, how many of you guys have never listened to an episode of the podcast? <laughs> yeah, what are you guys yeah. doing here? Tanner, why don't you tell them what our, what our little show is all about? Uh, so basically, Les and I, uh, I don't know, two and a half, three years ago, um, we used to get together a lot after church and uh, drink craft beer and talk theology, and then one day we decided to start recording it. And, I don't know, what are we, 111 episodes, 112 episodes? This is 112, yeah. yeah. Um, and along the way, I think, we have uh, picked up sort of uh, a good mission, and I, I think it, it's sort of like inviting young, reformed people along with us on our journey to Reformation. So over the past like, two years, we've both embraced the regulative principle. Um, we've both... Uh, what? Well, we'll become Pato Baptists. Yeah. Uh, it's a pretty big deal. <laughs> Thought you might like that. Um, yeah, so that's, that's yeah. what we're all about. It's kind of a documentary of our, of our journey out of young, restless, and reformed and becoming uh, more yeah. reformed. So. Yeah, that's good. good. Um, so uh, normally, at this segment of the show, we would talk about the beers we're drinking, but we're in a Baptist church. <laughs> So we're not going to do that. Uh, instead, we have some delicious coffee. Uh, Tanner, why don't you tell us about this, this special uh, This is a, This is a, a craft blend uh, coming uh, far away from uh, Chick-fil-A, actually. Chick-fil-A. Uh, Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. I've never heard yeah, of that. Yeah. So sacrifices have to be made when you want a chicken biscuit, so you've got to drink bad coffee. <laughs> okay. So it's bad coffee. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, if you'd like to follow us along on our pub journey, you can join our Facebook group. It's called the Reform Pub. Are any of you guys in the Reform Pub? Yeah, 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 uh, sorry about that. <laughs> it's a little crazy in there. Uh, and, oh, at the end, okay, so at the end of the show, we do this segment called Air Buddy in the Pub. And uh, during that segment, we're gonna ask you guys a question. Normally we ask it to like Facebook or Twitter, but we have a live audience right here. What is an embarrassing cage stage moment that you went through? You might want to explain the cage stage. Yeah, why don't you explain the cage stage? So, uh, do, do we credit James White with this? Is this, yeah, is this so. his term? Okay, so heard. cage stage is basically when you first become reformed, uh, or first become a Calvinist, um, you are, be he says you're better off in a cage than you are sharing. Yeah, your like your, your, your zeal is overwhelming, right. and you just want to like beat people over the head with A.W. Pink, and all you know is Romans 9, like eat, <laughs> sleep, uh, Romans 9. Uh, so, and then you're just like debating with everybody. So we're, we'll do that at the end of the show. We got a, a mic right up here. This conference is all about the gospel, which obviously is the most important thing that we could ever think of or, uh, or contemplate or, you know, or read about or learn about. Um, and it's especially, uh, over the past few years, as we've become more reformed in our theology, I think, uh, especially listening to the messages yesterday, I realized like how impactful reformed theology is on your understanding of the gospel, especially for people who came out of n not reformed backgrounds, right? So as these doctrines sort of click in place, you get these like 
grand new understandings of the gospel. Um, so Tanner, like, can you think of any moments in your life that were like really impactful and just like really changed your whole view? Yeah. And, it was actually when you and I, uh, before we actually met, but we were attending the same church, uh, at Calvary Chapel, interestingly enough, um, I had gone up to uh, our pastor and asked him, uh, I was really struggling with the idea of, of people going to hell. Um, and I went to my pastor and just asked him, I don't understand how a loving God can send uh, people to hell. And he actually, ironically, uh, turned me on to uh, Mars Hill Church at the time uh, when they were pumping out tons of stuff, and Mark Driscoll specifically. And uh, so I started to digest just, you know, Mark Driscoll, and then I got into Matt Chandler, and then kind of kind of the same roller coaster that I imagine a lot of you kind of went on. And I kind of came to, I think the big point for me was coming to terms with how I was actually asking the wrong question and realizing, um, as I discovered more about Reformed theology, realizing how holy God was mm -hmm. and, and how totally depraved I was and how my question initially was so man-centric and wasn't focusing on actually how deserving of hell I really was. And so that kind of started my journey into really uh, coming to terms with how holy God is and, you know, started off, uh, you know, starting off with number one, you know, the tool of total depravity. So do you feel like you got a better, like a, a much better grasp of why God sends people to hell? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I realizing that God is absolutely um, just in sending, you know, it, he would he would have been absolutely just sending me to hell in my first breath yep. because I'm, you know, conceived in sin. I'm completely depraved. Uh, and realizing that um, was was really just kind of the start of it all. And actually, it was due to conversations with you that uh, I came to understand, like, something about, like, the power of the gospel, especially, like, in Romans, Romans 1, Paul talks about uh, how he's not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for salvation. And I remember, like, before I became a Calvinist, I, I got, like, on this crazy roll of uh, putting notches in my belt for converting people, right? Like, I really got good at the sinner's prayer, and I would find people anywhere, and I, I, I really felt accomplished because it was like I was so nervous for such a long time, and then I finally got that real zeal to go out and just approach people, and I was bold with it. Um, and then I started talking to people like you and like listening to like Paul Washer sermon, sermons, and just like completely destroyed my idea of our will and our ability to choose God and choose Christ. And then I was like stuck. I'm like, okay, well, okay, so I can't save people anymore. Um, I'm, you know, I, there's no not all these notches in my belt are meaningless because I have all I did was coerce someone into like saying some prayer. Um, so then I was kind of stuck with like, so what's what do I do now? And then I had I just came to realize that like the gospel is actually powerful. The thing itself is powerful because the Holy Spirit is blessing it because it's God's means to save people. And that was uh, like a puzzle that had to be sort of clicked into place too, like. Um, if God's the one electing, God's the one regenerating on his own power, then what part do I play in that? You know, if it's all monergistic, then, you know, how do we, how do we sort of cooperate in that? And, um, yeah, so, so then it was just about clarity, really explaining the gospel as clearly as I possibly could, um, touching these people in their lives exactly where they, where, uh, that opening is there, showing them their guilt, and, uh, and presenting the gospel with power. It's almost like I saw this vision in my head of like all the other words I say in my life are like sort of neutral and like but then when I speak the gospel it's like this glowing these glowing words coming out because they're actually powerful and able to accomplish something beautiful so. you have a pretty cool to kind of play on the total depravity thing you have a pretty cool thing with the curtain that you always explain yeah so that's I guess yeah that goes along with like the absolute necessity again from Romans Romans 1 Paul says that that uh, men suppress the truth and unrighteousness and we hear that a lot, um, but especially when you think about presuppositionalism and stuff like that, uh, God is present. He is known to all men, right? And so if you can imagine that everyone can look up in the sky and just, there's God's face, right? We just see him. That's how clear it is. But we collectively as a human race have pulled a curtain over God's face to suppress him. We know he's there in the back of our minds, but we've covered him up. We don't want to deal with it. 
And then we put various idols, you know, false gods in front of that curtain to, uh, to trick ourselves into answering the questions that only God can answer, but at least we have something that, you know, looks like a God. And then that's, I mean, that's depravity, right? But uh, along with that suppression, uh, we know that God is holy, we know that God is powerful, and we know that we're guilty. So uh, the, the necessity of the gospel comes into play because when we walk up to somebody and we say, you know God exists, or we try to uh, explain to them how uh, the evidence points to God existing, whatever. If when we're doing that, what we're actually doing is encouraging them to walk up to that curtain and just pull it open and look at God, the God that you already know is there, which sounds great. Uh, which, I mean, if, you just, if you're just thinking religiously, there's a God, you need to face this God, do it. Just do it. Stop not doing it and do it, right? But the problem is that God is made of glory and fire and wrath and anger. So if they pull that curtain back, you're disintegrated. And, they, and that's the whole problem. That's the reason they won't open the curtain. That's the reason they have to suppress him in unrighteousness, because they're guilty, because they'll be judged, because there's, there's just no way you could face him. So we can't, right, inability, we can't look at God because we won't, because we don't want to, because we would die. It would be suicide. It would be spiritual suicide to look at this God. So in comes the necessity of the gospel. We can't just tell people, rip that curtain open. We have to tell people, yeah, he's going to kill you. Unless, unless he sent his son to take upon himself the wrath that's owed to you. And instead of being God's enemy, you can now be reconciled, brought into peace with him, and now you're his loving child who opens that curtain. Right? Like, but, and, yeah. and that's, that's and you, you mentioned like uh, presuppositional apologetics, and that's what's so, I, I love so much about presuppositional apologetics is that, you know, uh, one of the things about it is, is that you really can't convince anybody of the truth of the Bible without them coming to terms with the gospel. I mean, they're, because yeah. they won't rip that curtain open and face the, the triune God of the Bible because there's wrath with it without Christ. Exactly. So they have to come to, it's, it's, there's a, there's a process there where the, there, there has to, regeneration has to take place in that heart for them to be able to open that curtain and have, and approach the throne with confidence because of Christ. And it's, and it's, that's the essential, that's like the essential part of how our gospel even needs to be in our apologetics. Yeah, so you're, you're acknowledging that they know that God exists, they know he's back there, uh, but they, they, they refuse to acknowledge it. So um, you, you have to show them that they're taking it for granted, but all the while, Christ has to be central or else they literally can't admit it. Right. They can never acknowledge any of the situation. I think another thing for me, too, um, that really kind of blew open my uh, just understanding the gospel was coming to terms with God's sovereignty. I know that you and I battled over that for a while as we were, you know, kind of getting into Reformed theology. And I think, um, again, Romans. Uh, in Romans 8, one of the things that uh, once I came to term with how sovereign God really was, this, this piece of scripture really made sense to me. And in, in 37 through 39, Paul says, Know in all these things we are more than con conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I realize, you know, that without a completely powerful sovereign God, there's no way that that can make any sense. There's no way that, that without him being completely sovereign that we can't, something can't separate us because he has to be in control over all of these things that they're talking about here. He has to be in control over di death and life and angels and rulers. And, and so with his complete sovereignty over those things, we're actually, the, the gospel is secured for us. Our salvation is secured through his complete sovereignty. Yeah, R.C. Sproul famously says that if there's one rogue molecule in the universe, then you have absolutely no assurance that he can guarantee anything that he's promised about the future. Because that one, that one thing that he doesn't have control over ruins everything. Like sure. if he doesn't have control over everything, he doesn't have actually have control over anything. And when you like fight with people over the sovereignty of God, does God mm -hmm. control everything that happens? Or does he control like a few things and there's a, there's a few things here and there that he leaves up the chance? Or 
uh, a lot of people just want to say um, everything except for the human will is what God is in control over. But that's, or just sin. But that's just crazy. Like, that's all of human history. It's all men making choices. And if God can't be in control over sin or my sinful choices, once again, that's my entire life. My entire life has been sinful choices. So God hasn't ever had any influence in any of those choices. It's just, it's right. just, uh, and it, and it also kind of takes us, I mean, coming to terms with that really took me out of this, uh, like earthly mindset and it really helped me have just more of an internal mindset. Like the, you know, you look at most people in the world, they're on this just emotional roller coaster all the time. And, and I think even as Christians, we struggle with that with when we suffer, we have heights and, you know, lows. And what I really think in, in this scripture that, that, you know, is really being said is that there, because this salvation is secure for us and it is eternal, there doesn't have to be ups and downs. There doesn't have to be uh, any worry of being separated in those times of lows because it, God is, is so powerful that he's securing it for eternity for us. Praise God. Um, well, we, uh, hey Tanner, <laughs> would you like to play a game? I'd love to play a game. Let's play a game. Uh, so we went to a bar last night. Uh, we did actually make a pub. There was a pub in the pub cast. Um, and uh, there was a big pub meet. A lot of people from, uh, from that are here. How many, how many of you guys were out last night at, the, at Red Light, Red Light? All right. Um, so we had you guys supply us with some trivia questions. So we're going to play a little game called Pub Trivia. Um, so here's our little, little box. So there are the random questions that are supplied by you guys. We're going to go back and forth. I have no idea what these questions yeah, are. Yeah, I have no idea. So this could be embarrassing. So we'll, uh, I don't know. We'll go until we're bored of it. Or humiliated. <laughs> or hum well, yeah, that's what will actually happen. <laughs> All right, uh, Tanner, why don't you go first? All right. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, this this uh, question is coming from Rocky. It's a category of biology. Okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> how many calories can the human body process per hour? Or burn, he says, burn per hour. Um, okay. So uh, A, 150, B, 300, C, 200, or D, 400? Uh, 300. Is that your final answer? That's my final answer. That's correct. Yes. One for less. Can you, get, can you guys applaud every time yeah. we get a good answer? <laughs> every time we get it right. When we get it wrong, um, boo. Actually, seriously, boo. <laughs> I don't think that's what happens on, happens on game shows, though. But it would be funny. Okay, I've, never been yeah. I've never been booed from a stage before. I guess so. boo. <laughs> yeah, boo. Uh, uh, next one is from, uh, oh, Sam. Sam Barfield, that's Tanner's wife. Uh-oh, I better get this right. My wife. Uh, on what TV show was the first toilet shown? Oh, I know this. I know this. Okay. Uh, only okay. because it's your wife. Uh, I Love Lucy, Dick Van Dyke, MASH, or Leave it to Beaver? Uh, it's gotta be I Love Lucy. That's incorrect, that's what no, I thought it was too. Really? Uh, Boo! That's my, in my defense, that's my, like, my wife's favorite show of all time, so. <laughs> We asked the audience to boo us. It's awesome. Uh, the correct answer is leave it to Beaver. Good question, Sam. Thanks, wife. <laughs> You're up, Tanner. Oh, yeah. All right. That's one for me, zero for you. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, another one from my wife. My uh, wife. Category is music. Uh, in which key do most car horns honk? Is it the... Oh, yeah. A, the key of B, B, the key of F, C, the key of D, or D, the key of C. <laughs> this is really tough. That's clever. Um, uh, was one of them E? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, was one of them C? Yes. Which one was C? D. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, wait, I'm going to say D as my, the, the, I'm going to say the, 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 the option D, which option is the key C? The key of C. Okay, that's what I'm saying. That is incorrect. Okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> that's 
What's the right answer? Oh, I'm sorry. It's uh, the key. It's the key of F. The key of F. That's 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 helpful information. <laughs> so that's um one one. Next question. There's no name. Don't give me categories. Um, in light of the recent spur of political posts, what does the Fourth Amendment allow or prohibit? Okay. Uh, Self-incrimination, the right to bear arms, unlawful search and seizure, or cruel and unusual punishment? It's unlawful search and seizure. That is correct. America. America. All right, that's uh, two for Tanner. Right, right? No, it's yeah. one for me. No, two. No, that's yeah. only a second question. That's two. No, I, that's one. Okay, it's one. One, one, one. One. <laughs> You're up. All right, this is coming from Zach Dewey. I have no category, uh, but the, <laughs> uh, the question is, what is the ABV of Ballast Point Sculpin? Well, these are tough. <laughs> you can give me like point. Okay, uh, A, 7.2%, B, 7.5%, C, 7.9%, or D, 7%. Come on. I know, it's tough. Was one of them 7.5? Uh, <laughs> Les, I don't know because he didn't indicate which answer is correct. <laughs> wait, 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 no, don't, don't say it. What? Yeah, don't say the answer. I need the answer. Um, I will say seven. Wait, what was this? What was B? B is seven point five. Yeah, I'm gonna say B. Seven point oh. <laughs> It's the worst feeling in the world. It's awesome. Why don't you guys come up here and get booed? <laughs> um, next uh, comes from Noel Foster. Uh, the category is history. Uh -oh. Which one of these is not a Puritan? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> George Swinock, John Owen, Jonathan Manton, Jonathan Edwards. Can you do them again? George Swinock, that's A, B, John Owen, C, Thomas Manson, or D, Jonathan Edwards? A? That is incorrect. <laughs> boo. Boo. Boo, boo. Uh, Jonathan Edwards is the correct answer. He's not a Puritan. You're up, Tanner. Okay. Uh, the question is, which one of these is a Virginia craft beer brewery? Is it A, Black Mountain, B, Licking Hole Creek, C, St. Andrew's Brewing, or D, Great Dismal? Dismal. Uh, a, C, a C. St. Andrew's Brewing? Yeah. Uh, that is incorrect. <sighs> it's uh, Licking Hole Creek. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, what's the score? Uh, I think you have to use one to one, one to one still. That's awful. We're terrible. Didn't I get another? I told you we embarrassed ourselves. I think I got another one. No, I probably didn't. Okay. Uh, you got the scope one wrong, and that was yeah. Okay. Still one one. Yeah. Uh, next one comes from David Carnes. David Carnes, what's up, David? David He's here. Yeah, he is. All right. Oh, we should be asking that with everybody. Um, the category is Calvin. Okay. Um, which New Testament books did John Calvin not write commentaries on? A. Philemon, 3rd John, and Revelation. B. 2nd John, 3rd John, and Revelation. C. 2nd John, 3rd John, and Jude. Or D. Galatians, Titus, and Revelation. I know Revelation is one of them. Um, That's a tough question. Can you... Read them again? The ones with Revelation in it. Uh, a, Philemon, 3rd John, and Revelation. B, 2nd John, 3rd John, and Revelation. Or D, uh, Galatians, Titus, and Revelation. Is saying it wrong? Oh, man. I don't know. Uh, I'll go with A. That is incorrect. Yeah. Yeah. Boo. Boo. Uh, that's tough. Boo, you got John, John Calvin question wrong. Um, well, you know, the, the correct, correct answer, answer is B, 2nd John, 3rd John, and Revelation. I got two uh, of them. I got two of them. Yeah, you got two of them. 
Um, let's, let's do, do one, one more. One more. One more each. Okay. Let's do this. I'll look at the box. Stop. You see the answers. Uh, this is coming from Jordan Stevens. In which year did Metallica release their debut album? I would have got this one right. I wouldn't have. Uh, this is a good Oh, man. Uh, A, 1995. B, 1979. C, 1983. Or D, 1980. And I'll give you, a, I'll give you another point if you can tell me the name of the album. Um, 1979, is that B? That's B. I'll say B. All right. Do you have any idea of the name of the album? Is that correct? That's incorrect. Dang. I only know the black album. It's disappointing. It is disappointing. You guys can long. boo me for that too. Yeah. You should. That's when they that's when they cut off their hair and sold out. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> all right, you're up. What's, What's the name of the album? album? Kill 'em all. Kill 'em all. Kill 'em all. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, we know a lot about Metallica, at least. <laughs> um, and uh, last one. From Sean Grogan, still 1-1. One, one. Yes. We are or all for yeah. everything. Uh, the category is uh, something Calvinist. What is it? You know? Uh, Sean? Sean, are you here? No. Uh, something Calvinist is the category. The question is, which of these men are not a council member of the Gospel Coalition? Seriously? 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 I can't get another question? No. Okay. Uh, yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> what was the answer, by the way? Uh, well, the, I'll, I'll, the options are D.A. Carson, Ligon Duncan, Tim Keller, or Matt Chandler. Of those, what, what would you have said? I have no idea. Yeah, it's Matt Chandler. Matt Chandler. Okay, uh, last question. Matt Bissering. Yeah. Uh, the category is Star Trek. Um, the question is, in what year did Captain Picard first grace our television screens along with his odd, secular, humanist brand of post-millennialism? <laughs> Was it uh, 1990, 1986, 1987, or 1989? I want to say... That is incorrect. We're terrible. Boo. 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 Right. boo. Well, we, we tied. We're so bad. We're, we're so bad. Uh, 1987 was the correct answer. Really? See, that's how we play pub trivia. Yeah. <laughs> this is terrible. Bad at theology, bad at games. I don't even know what we're doing anymore. Yeah. Okay. We're, hey, Tanner. <laughs> Would you like to get into everybody in the pub? Yes, yes. Let's get into everybody in the pub. Um, so we asked a question at the beginning of the show. The question was, uh, would you share with us your most embarrassing cage stage moment or an embarrassing cage stage moment? Does anybody, anybody have anything you'd like to share with us? Yes, right here. Yeah, yeah, just go up to the mic. Um, name, favorite beer, and favorite theology book. Uh, Matt Vissering. I flew all the way down from Marquette, Michigan. From Michigan? Yeah. Woo! <laughs> uh, favorite beer? That's really tough. Um, I'll, I'll go with, uh, ooh. I'll go with Sierra Nevada Stout. That's a, that's a good one. Excellent. That's what we're going with. And what else? Uh, your favorite theology, theology book. Hmm. I'm gonna go with, um, Tim Keller on prayer. All right, all right, all right. Tim so Keller. So that was really good. Excellent. Okay, so embarrassing cage stage moment. Yes, please share with us. I believe it was in 2010. I was riding with my brother in his truck, and we ran over a raccoon. <laughs> and I was like, God predestined that to happen. That, this truck is the sword of the Lord, I said. <laughs> So, you know, the predestination was just, it was all I could think about, and so there, we hit a raccoon, that was predestined. Was your, was your brother on board? Um, he was, I, I couldn't quite tell what he thought, he was kind of like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. It's ironic too because uh, we have the whole uh, all all raccoons are enemies. Yes. So it's actually, well, no, I guess it's not good to run over our minions. No, okay. No, don't, don't run over our minions. That's not good. Uh, my name is Zach Dewey. I'm from Kingsbury, California, but I'm going to school here at RTS Orlando. Uh, favorite beer? I'm, I'm kind of going through a transition right now. Okay, okay. Uh, we can sympathize. We've been there. My favorite beer has always been Firestone Walker's Parabola, Bourbon Barrel Age Imperial Style. It's the best thing. Uh, but I'm transitioning, I think, into liking their Parabat Java, which is one of their like variations of it, because um, it's an imperial coffee style. Where, Where did you say you're from? Kingsburg, California. Okay. Central yeah. California. Yeah, yeah Firestone. Beer is... Fresno. Oh, awesome. It's like an hour and a half from We only had a few Firestone beers that were graciously sent to us, and they yeah. were all amazing. Yeah. They are perfect. Uh, <laughs> Firestone's amazing. So good. I go there at least a few times a year. Anyways, the Parabat Java is really good. Um, yeah. Favorite theology book? It depends on what we're talking. There's so many good ones. Um, I think my favorite systematic theology at this point is probably Horton's Christian Faith. Nice. Um, but favorite book that I read recently that just really struck me was my professor's book, um, Reformed Catholicity by Mike Allen and Scott Swain. It's a great book on Sola Scriptura. Um, my embarrassing cage stage moment. It's not so much embarrassing, it's just funny. I'm kind of an introvert and I've always hated the idea of sales, but I think if Crossway listens to this, they should hire me because uh, when I became, became a Calvinist, I the first thing I bought was the ESP study Bible. I bought the big beefy one leather with my name on it and started just digesting Romans as quickly as I could. And then instantly I became their best salesman. I think like I just sold the ESV on everybody. Everybody was buying ESV study Bibles. Um, I was just like walking around, just like showing all my friends, like it's in color. Did you know? <laughs> <laughs> Look at these maps. Look at all these notes in the back. Look at all the commentary here. I was showing people the video that they put out. Yeah. I was just like, buy the ESV study Bible. It has descended straight. I became like an ESV study Bible onlyist. You know, yeah. like the King James onlyist. I became the ESV study Bible onlyist. Um, so That's yeah, that was my embarrassing moment. Excellent. Thank you. My name is uh, David. I apologize I didn't give you an easier trivia question. No, that's <laughs> great, great. Uh, I'm originally from Pennsylvania near Philadelphia, but I'm a student here at Reformation Bible College. Here RBC, in the, in the house! Yeah. Woo. Dude, I was watching all the videos, or the, the video for RBC. I want to go to RBC now. <laughs> so if anybody can like get me in there, I don't have any money, so if, I don't know if that's a problem, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll work it out later. We, we, feel, we all feel the same way. Okay, so. good. <laughs> So, um, uh, favorite beer would be a St. Bernardus, like the Belgian, Ooh. and then um, uh, favorite theology book would be Mortification of Sin by John Owen. That book is very, Absolutely. Fantastic. Very convicting. <laughs> yes. So, um, cage stage story, that would be, uh, it's a Pedro Baptist cage stage story. Uh, this is the man. best. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, so, um, uh, I think it was an independent Bible for a while, then we became Presbyterian when I was eight, and so I just kind of didn't think anything about it, I just thought it was normal. And so uh, I was a teenager, I was around 15, I think. My family became friends with uh, some Reformed Reform Baptist family, and their oldest son was my age. And one day he asked me, you know, why do you guys baptize infants? I'm like, well, I don't know, because the Bible said so, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so I never thought about it before, so we both started studying it. And uh, the next time we got together, I was like, man, I'm just going to lay the beat down on him. And I had this <laughs> idea that the more inflammatory language you use and the harder you come at them, the more likely that they're going to be convinced of your position. Yeah. So I basically told my friend that if you don't baptize babies, you're committing blasphemy against God. And then wow. I need to tell my parents this story. I don't think I, they actually know about it because I tried to soften the blow a little bit. It's kind of hard telling your friend that he's committing blasphemy. So I, since I wasn't baptized as a baby, I said, well, you know, I'm basically saying the same thing about my parents, too. And whoa! <laughs> well, you um, said your, your parents committed blasphemy then. Yes, by not baptizing me as an infant. Okay, okay. And so, um, thankfully, we still remained friends after this. Um, we debated this issue for about six months, and then we both got entirely sick of the issue and decided we didn't want to talk about it anymore. Uh, but we were still good friends, and um, we really became, we didn't know what we were talking about. And right. The debate really didn't go anywhere, but 
Um, that's my most embarrassing thing. I still can't believe I said that. I've hopefully matured a lot since then. Yes, absolutely. Bring it on to redemption. Thank you. What's up, Pito? What's up? What's up, that's Darren. Uh, it's my first time listening to the podcast. Yeah. So, Pito, uh, Pito <laughs> is in the pub. He's, he's always active in there, and he's, he just refuses to hit the play button on anything that we post. Yeah, my friends dragged me in here, and I had to listen, so. But no, just kidding. No, um, my, what were the questions again? <laughs> uh, uh, your, your name. My name, Pito Feliciano. My real name is Jose. Everybody calls me Pito. Favorite beer. Thanks, Pito. Favorite, um, your favorite, favorite beer. Favorite beer. I, uh, when reading Spurgeon late in the evening, I like a nice pint of straight Puerto Rican rum. <laughs> um, I'm down. That's awesome. And what was the other one? Your favorite theology book. Oh, it'd be the Second London Confession, 1689, of course. And then the... <laughs> <laughs> Good. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Boo. I used to like that, too. 1689 <laughs> still five minutes ago. Yeah. And the cage stage moment? Yes. Yeah, it was cage. Okay, so um, when I first became a Calvinist, I was like super hardcore extreme. And I had a group of friends with me, and I said, listen, basically, right now, I could walk into the middle of a gang war, get my body riddled with bullets, and walk out just fine, because I know I have to go evangelize him tomorrow. And then everybody looked at me like I was completely psychotic, and I didn't understand why. Uh, and that is it. Thank you, guys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you, you, Pito, you were psychotic. You actually were. Yes. Hello, Les. Hello, Tanner. Hello. Hey, good to finally meet you guys. Hello, fellow publicans. <laughs> publicans. <laughs> Love it. I've, 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 always, I've, always, I've always wondered something. If, if we're publicans because we're in the pub and then we leave for the Lord's Day and we come back, does that make us republicans? Yeah, that's republicans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't want to get political. <laughs> does, does that mean we have to vote for Trump? <laughs> Still the best joke that's happened today, so. It's, it's, okay, so, so my name is Andrew. Um, my, my favorite beer is... Uh, is what was your, your name? Andrew. Andrew. Andrew, yes. I'm from right here in Central Florida. So my, my favorite beer is cold. And, and my second favorite beer is free. Okay, yeah. I might reverse that order, but I'm right there with you. Yeah. So my, my most embarrassing cage stage moment is actually directed at myself. I was, uh, I was, I was saved through uh, Paul Washer screaming his way through a total depravity sermon, and I, I had a job interview the next day. And, and keep in mind, this is about 24 hours after I have, I have left my super Roman Catholic premillennial dispensational family, who now thinks I'm in a cult. And uh, the, the, the job interviewer asked me, he goes, do you think you're a good person? And so, up until this point, <laughs> so up until this point, the interview was going fine. I was like, I got this in the bag. And, and then all of a sudden, I start crying. <laughs> oh, man. And I said, no, I don't think I'm a good person. I'm a terrible person. <laughs> so, he started crying. So, so, I don't work there. So that, that's my most embarrassing Oh, that's awesome. That's so good. That's a tough, tough act to follow. Yeah. 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 Hey, gents. Uh, Les Tanner. So my name is Wes. Uh, my buddy Jason and I drove down from New Hampshire and Vermont. So a good 21-hour drive. Yeah. 21 hours. Woo! So he, that was actually the first time he listened to you guys, and he was blown away by the episode with Tony Arsenal with on Free Will. So he's like, well, I think I got him hooked now. So we have a new publican. Well, I'll let you give a plug. You have, you have your own podcast. Oh, okay. I guess I can do that. Thanks. You pushed me yeah. for the shameless plug. So if anyone's interested, uh, we, my buddy Jason and I, do, uh, do a podcast called Grace Alone Podcast. And it's all about Jason does college ministry uh, and really has a heart for, for students' apologetics. He's doing his MA in apologetics right now. Uh, and the whole idea behind it is we want to kind of distill uh, good, solid theology, apologetics, doxology and worship and discipleship and kind of put it in a way that is practical for college students and like young 20-year-olds and things like that. So 
Uh, we just recently did an episode with Calvin's Batman, just the other day, and we also had Greg Kokel on, and I would say those are like, I'm excited to put those out there because they were really encouraging conversations. That's awesome. Uh, we Is Calvin's Batman here? No, he, I think he has like a wedding or something today. Okay. Yeah. That was, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, Wes Hebert. So my favorite beer is probably a toss-up between either uh, Hetty Topper by The Alchemist, Vermont Brew. I don't know if you guys ever had that one. Oh, yeah. Uh, so good. Or uh, there's, a, there's a local one that's right down the road from me. Uh, the brewery is called Seven Barrel Brewery, and they have a really great oatmeal stout. It's, like, one of my favorites, too. Just, I buy, like, the growlers, and I'll just bring that home and drink that while, while reading some Spurgeon sermons and whatnot. Reasons for it. What's your favorite uh, theology book? Uh, and my favorite theology book is probably actually uh, Doxology and Theology by Matt Boswell. Um, he's a worship pastor down at uh, Providence Church in Texas. And I know his brother is a church planner up in Montreal whose shirt I am currently wearing. Uh, so that's probably, that's probably my all-time favorite book. It's really shaped how I lead worship. Great awesome. Book. awesome. Great book. Recommend it for anyone who hasn't, hasn't ever read it. Uh, and so my, uh, my cage state story was actually right after, um, it was a couple, couple months after I had, uh, I had come to Calvinism through, through Jason. He's the one that introduced me to the Doctrines of Grace. Uh, and we had a business meeting at church. And uh, a good friend of ours, Andrew, who we have on the podcast every now and then, is um, Arminian, though he won't admit it because he doesn't like labels. Uh, <laughs> He, he and I would have spirited debates about total depravity and, and predestination, limited atonement. We've had, we've had conversations about it. So we went into this business meeting, and uh, I voted against the decision that was made. So it was kind of like I left, and I was just like, oh, I can't believe they did that. Like, why, what would drive them to do that? And my buddy Andrew walks up to me, and he's like, you know, Wes, it's all right. God predestined this to happen. <laughs> he's giving me a good pat on the back, and I'm like, I hate that you're right right now. <laughs> so uh, since then, since then, uh, we've had enough conversations where we got him to admit regeneration precedes faith, and um, he he says he agrees with the most of the tulip. We're just trying to convince him of really like particular atonement and really just get him to admit predestination is what we say it is yeah. because that is what the Bible says it is. Okay. Yeah. So. I'm cage stage whenever I get in a conversation with him. Gotcha. <laughs> Fantastic. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. That was great. Uh, Tanner, real quick, do you have any recommendations? I do. Uh, so since we're in Orlando, uh, which is now uh, my place of, I've been living here for about two years now. I've uh -huh. discovered some really cool places. One of them was we went to a red light, red light, last night. Yep. Um, but if you guys are going to be in town for a little while longer, I'd like to recommend two awesome places to eat and or get beers. Um, number one uh, is a place called Taco China. So it's, uh, yes. it's downtown That's Orlando uh, on Mills, which is this really cool hipster area where there's just tons of like fusion cuisine and stuff, a lot of Vietnamese cuisine. But anyways, Taco China is basically Asian and Indian food put in tacos and burritos. So you can get a uh, butter chicken burrito or uh, uh, Thai braised beef taco. Uh, and there's like a, one of my favorite is the Indian curry dusted uh, chicken taco. So, um, so that's, that's one place. And then another place if you're looking for a really good beer um, and just really cool pub food, a place called Gnarly Barley. It's a little bit further from here, but if you're heading, I guess, towards the airport, uh, it's right by the airport, um, and they've got uh, this thing called Johnny Mac and Cheese, which is a roast beef sandwich with macaroni and cheese on it, and then they make homemade kettle chips, and they have uh, awesome beer on tap. It's just just a little hole in the wall place, but it's awesome. Fantastic. Yeah. I've been to Taco China. You should go to Taco <laughs> um, And uh, my reco is, um, if you guys are into Martin Lloyd-Jones, uh, there's this website that I think was just recently uh, put up, MLG, mljtrust.org. It has 1,600 Martin Lloyd-Jones sermons. Uh, it is such an amazing resource. Uh, if you guys know anything about him, like Martin Lloyd-Jones is just a fantastic preacher, brilliant man. Um, so check out mljtrust.org. Um, I think that's it, Tanner. Yeah. If you'd like to follow us on our pub journey, you can join our Facebook group called the Reform Pub, and you can follow us on Twitter at Reform Pubcast. 
we want to thank Ligonier so much for inviting us. Uh, we're so honored. It's, it's just amazing. Especially thank you to Jennifer Osteen for setting everything up. Thank, thank you, you so Jennifer. much, guys. So awesome. Uh, yeah, so that is about it. Uh, thank you guys for coming out. We hope you enjoyed the show as much as we enjoyed recording it. Uh, and please go subscribe and uh, continue listening in the future. Tip your bartender. Tip your bartender. Uh, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Until next time, cheers, cheers and amen. amen. Talk about Christ who died for like three days Here without delay and grab your IPAs This is heavy like holding a bazooka What topic hotter than the cold for your hookah Hear an episode while riding your car Talking Christ at the bars with pipes and cigars Glorifying and enjoying God is our one task Gotta make the fun last so don't drink it dumb fast If it hasn't gone flat then it makes it so glad Bring your own glass, it's for form pubcast